started. So, <clears throat> what we've been talking about this uh, this past week, and again, sorry for uh, missing your class uh, last week. I wasn't feeling well that morning, so uh, just decided to stay home and spare you my hacking up here. <laughs> Any potential diseases I had. Uh, we're feeling fine today, so uh, glad to be back with you. Sorry, it's going to be a short one. Um, but last week we were talking about learning and conditioning. Uh, that should be up on the internet for you. So if you haven't seen those lectures, go ahead uh, and take a look. That will be uh, part of your third test uh, coming up after this section. Um, but today, what we're going to start talking about, unless you have any questions, uh, is human development. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to that today before we start breaking down uh, any of the specific theories, or at least breaking them down too deeply. Uh, we'll start that tomorrow uh, and then continue it Thursday. So uh, look for news about the test that Thursday, for that, from that Thursday lecture, uh, or it might be back in here on Tuesday, just depending on how much you get through. Okay, so we're talking about uh, human development. And what we're interested in when we're looking at human development is how do we as human beings go from being pretty dumb babies, pretty helpless babies, if you consider how other animals um, look when they're born, how they act, how do we go from this kind of <laughs> lump of, of do-nothingness, not very smart, to being the smartest creatures on the planet. What is the psychological process of that development? And so a lot of the theories that do, that have to do with human development are interested in some aspect of that development. A few of them, for instance, are personality. And we took a pretty extensive look at a personality development uh, stage theory. What was that? What you got? No? Yes, sir? There it is, the psychosexual uh, stages. All right, so that's Freud's theory of, you know, you're in the oral stage at this stage, and if this happens, then you're going to have this personality. Um, other ones include things like moral development. Uh, we won't cover that in here, but uh, there's a pretty interesting set of theories about how children go from developing the morals of a child, which uh, at very early ages just looks like, hey, if it feels good to me, it's good. If it hurts, it's bad, right? Hot, bad. This is how little kids sort of think about the world. Doggy, bad. He bit me, right? And so we're thinking about going from that stage of moral development to a stage of moral development where you can think about something complex like who do you save on the train tracks or um, is it okay to steal and feed your family, these types of things, right? Kids can't really do that. They'll just say stealing is bad even when they've advanced a little bit. <clears throat> and then one that we will spend some time on, though not today, uh, is what we call cognitive development. And so in a cognitive development theory, we really are sort of honing in on those intelligence pieces. It's not quite the same thing, but we would recognize it as a type of intelligence, right? Being able to work out certain problems in the world, being able to understand uh, what's going on in front of you. <clears throat> All of this is gonna fit under the auspice of cognitive development. <clears throat> Who is that? <laughs> what do they mean? So um, what we want to talk about, though, today and, and the time we have is um, one of Jung's theories of development. If you remember, Jung is probably my favorite psychologist. He doesn't really do one of these stage theories, uh, and, and they were happening, right? Freud was doing them. Uh, but he didn't really think of it that way. He really thought about development in terms of development of the conscience, the consciousness, excuse me. So 
So Young is thinking about, well, how do children develop a sense of consciousness? He didn't call it that at the time. He called it something that we still say today called individuation. That is to say, he thought about consciousness as how do you begin to individuate yourself? How do you begin to think about yourself as an individual as you go through life? So when you're born, a funny thing about children, and we'll see this again when we look at the cognitive stages, when you're born, you, you don't really have a sense I mean, you're coming out of nothingness, right? Into this world. You don't really have a sense that things are separate. You don't really, like that doesn't mean anything to you yet. That I am me and you're you and that's the podium and this is the stage and there's the carpet, right? We don't have that sense of difference yet. We really sort of see the world as all put together. Now what's interesting about this is the Buddhists call this uh, non-dual. It's kind of a goal of Buddhism is to be able to see everything is connected, right? You're just an extension of me and I'm an extension of you. Right? That that is sort of a spiritual way to see the world. But Jung isn't necessarily talking about this. If you really get into Jung, you'll see that his theory is often aligned with Buddhist theory, which is interesting. <clears throat> But you don't have this sense of being separate. And so Jung says that you can see this in a kid. If I had a two-year-old up here, one and a half, say. And let's say the stage was 80 feet high. And um, on the border of the stage, there's a bunch of candy bars. <laughs> What's going to be going with this little kid, this one-year-old? What's that going to look like? Yes, ma'am. It's kind of like a baby. What's that? They're going to look like babies because they're going to get twisted. Yep. But then they're going to rise tall and they could get hurt, but they don't recognize that. Great. That's what I'm looking for. They can get hurt, but they don't recognize that. Well, if you've got an ego, and, you know, this is sort of a stretch, but the psychological purpose of your ego is to defend yourself, both mentally also physically, not to win there, it's danger. That's your ego talking. So the kids don't have this yet. And, and Young says that we can see this by the fact that they will readily put themselves into danger. That they have no sense of getting hurt. They have no sense of an end of life. Or maybe even pain in, in some respects. And so who has to not let the kid fall off the 30 foot stage? Who has to do that? Yeah? The guardian. Your guardian, right? Mom or dad, whoever's with them, babysitter. And so again, Jung is saying here that the kids don't really have a sense of individuation. They don't have a sense of ego. It's so diminished, it's so absent that they don't even know to protect themselves. They don't even have a sense of I can get hurt. I can die. Other evidence of this um, is, uh, and this is actually a pretty recent study that just points back to some old theory. Let's say again, I'm a one-year-old, maybe younger, eight months, and uh, this is my bottle, and I'm down here on the floor, sitting in my whatever babysitter. If I want that bottle, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do if I want that bottle? How might I let my guardian know? Cry. I might cry. I can't cry about anything. What else? I mean, that's probably going on, yes? I reach for it. I might reach for it. What does the reach look like? Show me how baby reaches. Yeah. You just did it, show me. Yeah. It's this funny thing that we realize in research is that 
At about two years old, babies stop doing this when they want something, then they start doing this. What's the difference? What's the difference between reaching for it and pointing to it? Yes, ma'am. At first, they're trying to like grab it like magically, like they think if I just like put my hand out and grab it, it'll like get to like one. But the second is like calling, it's like or it's like wanting, like asking. So yes. it is. So <laughs> you tell a lot, you got it perfect. So when you're doing this, and he, she says it's like you're trying to magically grab it, like it's going to get in your hand. Does this work? Like a baby. Does it work? Kind of. Kind of what? Because the parent will probably get it. Oh. Your yeah. other hand will show up <laughs> and grab it and give it to her. Right? Babies don't know they're separate. So this is me telling my brain or my other part of my body, you can get that. And then sure enough, my other body gets it. It's cool. So babies don't have this sense of separation, and we can see that in the fact that at first they're just trying to get it, and usually it'll show up. But eventually they realize, I actually have to tell it to somebody else, there's another person, there's a separate entity, and they need to indicate that it's that that I want, and not just try to get it myself. Does this make sense? This sense of, this developing sense of an individual, this developing sense of an identity, of an ego. Jung says that we can sort of track the development of a human by thinking about it like a sunset and a sunrise. He says when you're a kid, if the sun is your ego, you don't really have much of an ego in the sky. You're, you're just there as we've been talking about. But as you start to get older, at some point your ego will peak. You will be the most important person in the universe. Only what you want matters. And if you don't get it, well, fuck them. They just don't understand how important I am. Who's this person? The narcissist? Well, yes, but when do humans become narcissists? Maybe tough for you all to see out of your own perspective here, yes? Well, I mean, usually, I guess, for a majority of people, that would be around a toddler to like primary age. No, still, no? Okay. still around here, you know. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Maybe he was just being a dick. That's it. That's when your ego is at its height. I am important. I am self-important. Everybody should bow down to me. I'm going to change the world. Why can't people see how smart I am? That dumb teacher gave me a seat. <laughs> this is your teens and your 20s, right? When, as we see, people are really self important at that age. They're high in the sky. It's almost all they can think about is themselves. Not necessarily in a narcissistic way, but what am I going to be when I grow up? What am I going to do? Uh, after I graduate, what are my parents going to think about this? What are my buddies going to think about that? Right? Everything is sort of self-referential. Everything is about the individual, and that's appropriate. I'm not calling it narcissistic as a um, any sort of diagnosis. It, it's just what happens. At some point, you're full of yourself. That's all right. So, what does this mean? Say again? Like, what is the decline mean? Yeah, like, how do we think about that? Parenting? Just say some more. Like, once you've established yourself, and once you're starting to, I guess, age even more, you may have kids, you may have other people to tend to, and not think so much about yourself. That's exactly right. Once you become an older adult, kids are not, but kids are gonna definitely help speed that process up. You start thinking about other things. You might still think about your job, but your focus might be making sure your students get the information that they need, rather than how much are my students going to like me, right? 
It might be thinking about your children, right? Wanting to work for them, get them a good education, make sure they don't fall off the ledge, even at your own expense. I'll jump off here to get this kid if he's gonna, gonna fall down. Right? I'll put my own life at risk for certain things. More likely to happen here, not for everything, right? But for certain things that you feel are attached and connected. You're beginning to relate, if you like, your ego to other things, right? These things are a part of me. These things are things that I want to protect. I want to keep near me. I want to keep safe. And so Jung says that's what's happening as folks, you know, reach into their 30s, probably their 50s. They start to focus outward. They still know very well who they are, but they're not so focused on it. And then here. Who are these folks? Yes, sir. It's going to be like uh, when you get pretty old, people have to start taking care of you again. And then so you're kind of getting back to a state where, I don't know, you just kind of care more about yourself. Well, it's, it's the other way where you stop kind of caring about yourself, right? Yes, sir. I feel like that's like the time, like, you know, when people are taking care of you, you're thinking to yourself, well, how much longer am I really even going to be here for? It's like, what's the point of me trying to worry about myself type thing? If you're like, well, I mean, I may only be here for like another couple of years or so. I need to focus on like other people that will continue on and be here and live out what they want to do and everything. Very good. So one way to think about this is, is just as a, as a literal cognitive focus on others, right? That realization that maybe the, uh, the rest of your life is, is pretty short and maybe you should be paying more attention to the folks that can you know, carry something on, whether that be your inheritance or your love or your memory or whatever it is, right? And so you're focused on, I said that like a, you know, thinking about the individual, but they really are kind of thinking about others, right? They're really focused on maybe even their legacy, which isn't them, it's an aspect of them or it's related to them, but that's not them. They're not gonna be there for that. Um, and then also you might, especially thinking about uh, during Jung's time when we weren't as sophisticated about psychology and psychiatry at the time, one of the things that you might also fit into here is any type of dementia, any type of loss of cognitive function that looks, you can imagine, to somebody in the 1920s, if they're thinking about it in this way, is a loss of individuation. A person is losing a sense of themselves not just in terms of who they're focused on, but perhaps psychologically, deeply psychologically, such that they don't remember their name. They don't remember their kid's name, right? We're really talking about the men's show, but if you fit it into this model, you can imagine how <clears throat> Jung would have seen some of these old folks and said, oh, they're just losing touch with themselves. But that's another way to think about that. Questions about this? Again, this theory was really, you know, this is sort of the only chart for it. Uh, and so it's really just more about understanding that concept of the rising and setting sun or the rising uh, and setting ego. <clears throat> when we start uh, next week, we're gonna look at some of these, or next time, we're gonna start looking at some of these cognitive stages. We'll also start look, to look at uh, something that we call attachment. Uh, students tend to find that uh, somewhat interesting because it's this, thing that develops when you're young that really reflects or um, gives some predictions about what type of relationships you're likely to have in, in the present, in the future as an adult. Okay, so the other way, the other thing I could have put up here is just attachment, which is just relationships, how you attach to people. Questions? All right, that is it. I know super short uh, today. I do apologize. Uh, again, for short and being late, but here we are. Um, so again, on Wednesday, we'll keep talking about this, and then look on Thursday for info about the test. If you don't see it, just expect me to talk about it on Tuesday. Okay? Have a good week. Uh, so we've been talking about... Any questions for me? So uh, we've been talking about these past... Uh, 
development, in development. Uh, and this is basically, and I haven't uploaded yesterday's uh, lecture yet, but I actually we just attach it to, to today's, it was really short, I had to uh, leave class early, but um, we just started talking about the idea that uh, human development is just interested in the ways that children uh, go from being the psychology, the mindset, the relationships, the morals uh, that they have, how they go from that uh, to being fully fledged adults who are really smart, who can have relationships, who can think for themselves. <clears throat> and um, we mostly spent yesterday just talking about um, a concept, it's not really a stage theory, which is what we'll probably get into tomorrow. Uh, we talked about Jung's concept of <clears throat> aging, where he uses the sun as a metaphor for the ego, and he talks about how, as you get older in life, your ego becomes more and more important, uh, and that when you're young, your ego isn't really developed. What this means really is that you don't have a sense of yourself as an individual, as a separate uh, individual who has his or her own likes or dislikes or wants or needs. You really just see yourself as connected to everyone else in your life. Uh, I give the example of little children, and this is a study we've done um, up until I think age one or two, when they want something, they will just reach for it. Um, and this is some indication that they actually think that they can get it. And what we find out, of course, is that they, they can get it like this, right? How does this work? Come on, baby. How does this work? I'll wait a minute. That's your other hand, right? You don't have a sense of being a separate entity from anyone else that you see, certainly not your mother, certainly not your father. And so when you do this and you get it, it feels like, yeah, I just told my other hand to go get the thing and it brought it to me. When they get about two, they switch to pointing, right? Here's an indication, somebody else is here and I need you to get it for me. I need a different person to do this for us, right? I'm indicating to someone else, which suggests, right, that I'm beginning to form an ego, I'm beginning to sense myself as an individual or sense other people uh, as not me, as someone separate. And so I start making different decisions based on this. We get about here, right, when your ego is full in the sky, what age do you think this is? So, maybe 17 to 30 or so, okay. When you're in your 20s right now, when you're the most important person in the world right now, right? It's appropriate, I'm making a joke, but it's appropriate. At some point, you have to really start focusing on yourself and doing for yourself. That looks egotistical, because it is. Um, but it's the way we're designed. We're supposed to, at this point in our lives, be really thinking about how can I move ahead and what's best for me, Who's, who should I be in a relationship with for this type of thing that you're not thinking about here, right? You're, you're maybe doing things in your best interest, but you're not thinking about it that way. You're not concerned with yourself in that way. Uh, I give the example of children at this age will, will hurt themselves. They'll walk off, you know, the side of a building if you tell them there's some candy down there, and there is, oh gosh, right? There really is candy right there. <laughs> right, and so kids will be like, oh, and somebody else has to come and save them from that. So you get back in the ledge, you're gonna fall. Here, they don't even have the sense of protecting themselves, right? And so you get here and you're super self-interested. Uh, you're interested in protecting yourself, but you know, your ego's so high in the sky, you're like, I can't get hurt, I'm vulnerable. I'll jump out of a plane, I'll drive 95 down the highway, and, right? Who would kill me? Who could kill me? into your 40s and 50s, your ego is a little less important because now you're focused on, I don't know, maybe your job, maybe your wife or husband, 
to your kids, certainly, right? And so you're still very aware of yourself, but you're not living for yourself, probably, in the same way. In fact, if you see someone who's 50, who seems really egotistical, seems really full of themselves, how does that come across? What do you think about that person, generally? Got a 50-year-old who's bragging. You got a 50-year-old who's you know, only doing things for uh, himself. You got a 50-year-old who's, you know, well, step in front of a, a kid to get the, the thing he wants in mind. He wants a new iPhone. Look at this kid. What kind of person is this? Well, we'd probably, I mean, this isn't a trick question. We would probably call them pretty immature. That's how that would come across. A little too old to be, right? So self-important, so concerned with, I don't know, image or yourself, right? Because we recognize that as something uh, that, that that this age group is doing. And then you're back down here again. What's this look like? Well, this is old age when. You're maybe really, really focused, not only on your children, but maybe your grandchildren, right? You're really focused on these other people. You're maybe thinking about yourself in a way that is not so egotistical. Well, it's egotistical, but it's removed from yourself in the sense that maybe thinking about something like your legacy, how you'll be remembered, what you'll leave to other people. It's about you, but it's not about you. It's me. I'm going to be dead, right? It's about what you're leaving behind, what the, um, what the point, perhaps, of your life was. And then also, when we're thinking about the time that this was happening, um, all these arrows don't, don't are necessarily helpful, but um, we're thinking about the time when this was happening back in the 1920s. This is a time when we would also wouldn't have thought about things uh, such as dementia, that's gonna include stuff like Alzheimer's. We wouldn't have necessarily thought about that as so much of a disease as we do today, we might have just considered it, well, these folks are getting old, and that's what that looks like, and to a degree it is. And so this also looks like a bit of a loss of ego, certainly if you're young in the 1920s, young in the 1920s, not uh, young. Um, any questions about that? I spent a little bit more time talking about it uh, in yesterday's lecture, so um, you'll see some of the same stuff, but a little more detail. But what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of attachment theory. Attachment theory. Um, attachment theory is interested in how the relationships of our childhood usually our parents in particular, usually our mother specifically, how the relationships of our childhood affect our ability to attach, that is to say, to a form of relationships with other folks uh, in adulthood, in the future. So attachment theory is connecting this idea of something going on for the kid in childhood with something going on with them as an adult, in particular how they form relationships. So there are three different styles of attachment. We can say there's really two, and then one's broken up. So you've got secure attachment. This, of course, is the gold standard um, of attachments, which is to say uh, you're capable of forming relationships. You're capable of attaching to people. But you're also independent enough to kind of watch that relationship not come and go, but you know, the person leaves for the day, the person has to go on a business trip, and that doesn't fill you with anxiety, right? You're able to watch them go and say, yeah, I mean, I know they're gonna still love me and they'll be back and I'll be happy to see them when they get back, right? They'll come back and be happy to see them. Oh God, I missed you. All right, but you're okay. Um, so you have ability to separate and come back together uh, in a way that feels fine for you, 
Um, and in the midst of that attachment, in the midst of your togetherness, you're also pretty comfortable uh, with being together with that person. The other form is, of course, insecure attachment. And there are actually two of these. The first is, well, let me say about insecure attachment, probably, uh, before I go on. These are still attachments, understand. These are still attachments. If you've got an insecure attachment, that's okay. I will show you in just a second some that aren't okay, but uh, this is still an okay attachment. So some of you are going to see yourselves <laughs> in these attachments, uh, whether you're in, in the room or watching it. That's fine. Uh, it may be some stuff to work through, work on, uh, but it's, you can still have relationships. You can still have really happy, functional relationships. So don't look at this and go, oh God, that's me. So in an insecure attachment, we've got two types. The first type uh, is what we call an avoidant attachment. Someone who's got an, an avoidant attachment uh, is, is a person who has maybe sort of gotten used to being attached in a detached way. Um, so this type of person isn't necessarily going to feel particularly bad when, they're, when their partner leaves or when someone they like leaves. Um, but they also probably aren't going to get too excited when they come back. Um, this person has maybe just learned through attachments uh, in their life that people come and go. They're not always, um, they're not always going to be there for you. And so I've, I can attach to people, I can form relationships, but uh, I'm not going to necessarily be too enthusiastic about that. I might also, in terms of getting into attachments, be a little bit hesitant about getting into attachments because, I don't know, you, you might leave, you might uh, just waste my time. And so you have this sort of avoidant relationship with relationships. By the way, when I'm saying attachments, I don't just mean romantic attachments. That's going to, of course, be a pretty heavy part of this, but I am talking just about friendships, I'm talking about working relationships, anything. And so again, here in this attachment, you're sort of, you're almost over. You'll get in a relationship, but um, you're gonna want your space. Right? You're not gonna like somebody who's maybe all over you or particularly needy, this type of thing. The other one is what we call an ambivalent attachment. Um, what does ambivalent mean? Anybody know what that means? Ambi? Yes? What's ambi mean? They're strong. Uh, no. Ambi? Ambient? Dexterous. Good try. Yeah. wonder how that's related. Ambient? Um, <laughs> no. So you have like multiple attachments? <laughs> um, ambivalent means both. And in particular, well, ambi means both, but ambivalent in particular, particular means you feel both ways. You feel two ways, right? This is, uh, you know, you're on the high dive, and you want to jump, and you don't want to jump, right? That's ambivalent. I, I'm, I'm holding two feelings at the same time. And so here in this ambivalent attachment, what you get is, is somebody who is, is on their way, not really, but they're almost kind of an avoidant attachment. That is to say, um, they probably also have relationships that have been unreliable. They probably also have relationships that maybe come and go, uh, and people don't necessarily either return their affection or return it when needed. And so this type of attachment is, the way they handle this is in a way that actually looks sort of clingy. They will be really upset when their partner leaves. Oh, you're leaving again. No, where are you going? They might be a little bit jealous and can come across a lot of different ways but they're gonna have a hard time with that separation. You gotta go away for a business trip, you gotta drop them off at, uh, at school or daycare or something, they're gonna cry, they're gonna be upset, they're gonna not be happy with this, with this leaving. They're at least gonna be very, very sad, if not angry. But then when you come back, they're, they're probably still gonna be angry or upset with you. Oh, you're back now. 
oh, you, you know, you were gone for three weeks and now you want to talk to me, right? This is this person who had some feeling about you going away, but then when you come back, they, they still are happy that you're back deep down, but they're going to express or at least show this kind of anger uh, or this upsetness. That might again come across as clingy, that you may show up, oh my god, oh my god, you've been gone so long, please leave again. Right? In that case, they're probably also anger, that's the part they're hiding. Right? So they might show you both, they might show you one or the other, but they're going to have a strong reaction to your return, and, and also to your departure. Whereas this person, okay, well, I'll see you when you get back. Oh, you're back? Yeah, cool, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. You guys get this difference? Yes. yes, maybe? Yes. Okay. Um, so again, these are still attachments. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making them a little dramatic just so you can get the sense of them, but uh, they are still attachments. These people are going to still be able to be uh, in relationships. There's actually a psychological disorder uh, called a reactive attachment. reactive attachment disorder and this is the attachment style often of children who've been severely abused uh, or severely neglected what's going on here psychologically is that these children um, when they are trying to form attachments when they're beginning to form their ego well they're they're noticing that nobody's helping them they're noticing that maybe some everyone's hurting them, right? That the people in their life are not caring, they're not helpful, they maybe are a threat or a risk to you. And so, again, these are attachment styles, even here, right? People are generally good sometimes, well, they leave you hanging, but if you prove yourself, these folks, they're over. These, these are usually children, this is a, diagnosis specifically for children, uh, but these children do not trust adults, they won't listen to adults, they, they um, cannot be negotiated with, even in the way that children can be negotiated with. Listen, sweetie, if you're really good today, I'll take you to the park or I'll give you that thing that you want. No, I want this right now. I'm going to cry and scream until you give it to me, and if you don't give it to me, well, then you're just going to have a really bad day because I'm good at crying and screaming. Sometimes these children try to hurt people, literal children, uh, try to kill their parents, try to kill their siblings. I mean, that's an extreme case, but this is just to demonstrate that these folks don't form attachments. They don't see other people as helpful or good people or uh, in the world or in their life for good purposes. And so it's just them against the world as far as they're concerned. Uh, and so they will often, if not just be uh, really separate or untrusting, they, they may also try to seek some type of uh, revenge or uh, take some type of anger out on them. Yeah? I had a guy I went to high school with who would always cut me when he was older. Kind of weird, I guess. Kind of showed a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but then years later, after high school, he ended up killing his mom. Mm -hmm. Not to get down there, but. Sure, I mean, well, these folks, um, so again, this is a, a child's diagnosis. Um, it doesn't necessarily just transform into this. Like if you're a kid and you turn 18, I'm not gonna just say, okay, well now this is your diagnosis. But often we see these children turn into folks who uh, have an antisocial personality. Uh, this is the personality that we call sociopathy or psychopathy, right? And if you're wondering how folks get this way, it is because they live in a world, and you hear this all the time, and you know, sometimes we, Think it's sad and sometimes they're like you're too bad you're an adult you got to make your own decisions but you hear it all the time right when you hear somebody really terrible um, in terms of being a murderer or being a rapist right they often will say well i was abused or neglected and they're not lying again often they have this attachment style and they turn uh, into this type of person as an adult they learn as a kid nobody's here to help me so i'll do whatever it takes to get ahead and if I have to kill you because you're in my way or just giving me a bad time, then I'll do that. I have no empathy for you. The other thing it can turn into is something we call um, borderline personality disorder. These are both personality disorders. 
Um, borderline personality disorder is kind of similar to this. I like to say, not to be sexist, but it, I think it's just to get helpful to think about it this way. It's really kind of more of a feminine version of an antisocial personality. Um, and I say that because women cannot, in our society, generally get away with as much aggression, overt aggression and anger uh, that men can. And so uh, women have to do things a little bit differently if they want to get their needs met, which is the purpose here. If nobody's helping me, make sure you get your needs met. And so uh, borderline folks tend to be more manipulative in terms of getting their needs met. Uh, any social force can be manipulative too, uh, but they're usually kind of a calculated manipulation. And if I tell this person this, they'll do that for me, um, and I'll get what I want. Uh, this person is manipulative in an emotional way. How could you possibly leave me here with these people uh, with, with no money? Uh, you're, you've got to leave me here with a thousand, I don't know, I'm making it up here. But they're going to be emotionally manipulative. In particular, they're going to be emotionally manipulative about folks leaving them, about a sense of separation, about a sense of uh, jealousy. You know, this, this type of person's going to be really aggressive, really nasty, really suspicious around those type of things. Um, Folks with borderline are all often given the tag, I'm not going to write it, but often given the tag, uh, I hate you, don't leave me. Like this sort of push and pull um, in the relationship. It, it, it reminds me of, a, of an extreme, please don't misunderstand, but an extreme ambivalence that's happening. Uh, where this is, a, is almost complete non-attachment, there's something going on. The borderline folks want an attachment. Uh, but they usually still come out of these uh, these two types of relationships or childhood. Questions uh, about that? Yes, ma'am. Does like multiple personality disorder have to do with any like this at all? Can that be? Something? It's a great question. Um, we don't usually see it as related to a reactive attachment, but we often do see it related to abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. uh, what's usually going on for folks who have um, multiple personalities, or what we call today a dissociative identity, um, is that there usually is, again, abuse or neglect in their childhood. Um, these things could go together, but let's say that uh, they somehow learn that people will take care of them. Maybe mom and dad are abusive and neglectful, uh, but grandma and grandpa who they see regularly show them love. And so they, they, can, they can still learn to attach. It doesn't have to be your parents. It needs to be somebody, really. It could be coach, neighbor, friend. Um, but that stuff has to happen before age two, before you uh, get into some of this stuff. That's when they kind of figure out, okay, it's just me. But if they uh, have gotten love and respect somewhere and they're being abused and neglected, um, often what can happen with these kids is they have no real defense. They can't fight back, really. They're too weak. Um, they, they can't even necessarily, in their head, get angry or necessarily uh, make some excuse for why this is happening, right? These are all just defense mechanisms. This has happened to me. This is a, a situation I don't want to be in. How do I negotiate that so you engage in the defense? Kids don't have that ability yet. So usually all they have is denial at first. Um, and then if it gets really intense, they, of course, have regression or, excuse me, repression. If you remember repression, that is when you just kind of forget it. You make yourself forget it uh, unconsciously, or consciously it's forgotten, but unconsciously you, your, your mind somehow still holds on to it. Well, these kids may repress or dissociate into repression so often. They may come away from themselves with dissociating. Daydreaming is a dissociation. It's okay, it's good. It's good news. So they may come away from themselves so often that in the absence of their personality, in the absence of their own ego, another ego begins to deform. Another personality shows up in the absence of their own ego. Often this is a personality who can handle the abuse, who, who, maybe, who can handle it, right? Who's tough, who's a little more cold, who's a little bit maybe even compassionate towards the first identity. It sucks that this is happening to you, but so there's some kind of relationship usually that's forming or some type of role, at least, that's forming uh, in that absence. And so you see this person who maybe uh, begins to split themselves in that way. That's a good question. Okay. 
So, how do we test for this? Um, this is a, 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 a thing that's a pretty well-known experiment. You saw me pull it up uh, here just a second ago, um, and I will show it to you. Um, but basically the idea, or the way that we begin to test for this, is we, we take children and we put them in what we call the strange situation experiment. So, you saw me Google that. The strange situation experiment. Uh, what this means is you have a kid, you bring this kid into a room, a strange room, it's a place they've never been, so it's not in their home. Um, it's a, an experiment, so actually it's usually in a psych lab somewhere. And so you bring your kid into the psych lab with their mother, or you let their mother uh, actually bring them into the lab. And then you just let them play, there's usually toys or something around to kind of engage the kid. You let them play around for a little bit. And then you'll signal somehow, usually just a knock on the wall or something, uh, for the mother to come out of the room and leave the kid. So here's our first test of attachment, right? What happens when mom leaves? What should happen? What, uh, anybody got a kid or no kids? What happens when you drop them off at daycare the first time? It's a strange situation. What happens when you take them to school the first time? What's that mean? Oh, terrible. Well, how, how so? They're gonna be crying and not wanna do it. It's gonna be hard. That's right. They're gonna be, ah, what are you doing to these people, right? They're gonna be freaking out, uh, probably. Per normal, good. Your kid loves you, does not want you to leave. You're in, a good, you're in a good place, good start. So then the mom comes back. Um, well, let me say, so the secure kids are gonna cry. That's, again, good spot. The ambivalent kids are going to cry. Ah, no. The avoiding kids might cry. Mm -hmm. She leaves all the time. Mm -hmm. right. And so this is the first step. We're kind of getting a sense of, okay, well, how are they reacting when they leave? Um, and then we let the kid cry for a little bit. <laughs> a minute, not long. And then we send the mom back in. And then what happens? What happens when you pick the kid up from the day? He starts crying. He starts crying? He stops crying. He stops. Well, he's cried the whole time? He's been gone four or five hours and he's still he's crying. Eight oh, hours. well, you said, you said it, like you bring him back in and I thought you meant like 10 minutes later. Sure, sure. But in, the, in, a, in a real daycare situation, what would happen? Oh, they'll eventually get over it or well, forget about it, right? Sure. <laughs> what happens when you arrive? Yes, they're happy to see you. Mom, or dad, right? Oh my God, look at the things I finger painted. This is Miss Becky, she's really nice, she has a dog, right? This is how the kids are gonna uh, react. Again, this, we're looking for that secure attachment. They were sad to see you go, but happy to see you return. This is the mark of the secure attachment, at least with regard to this experiment. They're, they're, they can see you go and that upsets them. Again, they're gonna miss you, they do love you, they are attached to you. But they will eventually get over it in the course of the day, right? such that it's not the end of the world. And when you show back up, they're happy to see you. Oh my God, dad's here, awesome. They may not want to leave, that's not necessarily about the attachment, but it also suggests that over that period of time, they adjusted well, right? No, 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 I don't wanna go yet. They're still happy to see you, right? But they wanna stay and play with uh, Miss So-and-So's dog. When you come after the avoidant kid, who wasn't really, sad to see you go in the first place, and when you come back, they're going to be probably equally lukewarm to see you return. Oh, mom's here. Cool. Let me just finish this. Okay. Right? And they're not going to be like, oh, mom's here. They're not going to have much of a reaction, right? Again, she leaves all the time. This, this happens every day. I'm not, it's not a big deal to me. It's not a big an emotional event. The ambivalent kid is going to be sad to see you go, maybe more so than the secure kid. This is devastating. Mom leaves all the time. And sometimes she's gone for three weeks. I don't know when she's going to be back this time. I'm freaking out. How long am I going to be in this random place? Right? This is what the kids think. You come back just four hours later. The kid may still be pissed off. This may be the kid who was pissed off for those whole four hours. Wouldn't play with anybody. Sat in the corner crying for mom the whole time. Right? And when you get there, they're still crying. You pick them up, come on, sweetie, let's go home, and they're fighting. Yeah. Right? They don't want to be there. They're, they're crying the whole time. But they're also still angry with you, so they give you this kind of 
how the reaction that you're returning. If you try to leave again, they lose it, right? So it's not that they don't want to see you. It's again, they feel both ways. I'm pissed at you that you left me for four hours. Don't you dare leave. Take me with you. So you kind of get this uh, ambivalence. I feel both ways about you coming back. Questions about those or that and stuff. So um, let's just watch, let's just watch uh, these videos.
Questions about any of these, just based on what you saw? Did that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am? Is this based on parenting or is it the kids? It's based on it's based on parenting. It is based on whether or not the parent, uh, as you're hearing them say, is is available, right? The kid is learning. We want time today. So one of the things that uh, you might see in the next couple of days is something that we call Harlow's monkeys, and we talk about how um, relationships are, are formed, why children love their parents in the first place, like how does that turn on? Um, and so basically the kid who's learning that his mother or father is um, a secure base, they're learning that they love them, they're gonna provide for them, this gives them the confidence in a strange situation, not one here where the mother leaves, but it gives them the confidence in one of these situations if the mother stays, for them to go explore, go try, other things. They'll often check back uh, with their with their mother, um, but it, it gives them that confidence to kind of reach out and do other things. When they don't have that same sense of the relationship, when they don't have that same sense of connection, this is when they start having some anxiety. These are both really just types of anxiety about relationships, and so um, it is the parent's duty to set that up, as well as this, of course, right? This is sort of not just maybe not paying attention, but going the other way. Um, so it is really more dependent on the parent than it is the child. I will say if you're adopting a kid, for instance, or foster care, some of this stuff may already be set up. And so there is a way for folks to move out of these type of attachments. I'm not sure about this, honestly, especially when they're older. Uh, but th there are ways for people to move out of this and a little closer to this. Uh, this is often something therapy is doing by kind of reinstituting a safe, reliable, supportive relationship. Uh, or you can just have this in another relationship. You are ambivalent about getting into a relationship, but you get into one and it teaches you, hey, you know, this is safe. These, these people, this person is loving me. Maybe other people can love me, right? This type of thing. Uh, and so you can see people shift. Um, to, to having a more secure attachment style. But yeah, it's based on other folks. Other questions? Yeah. So, if the child is already in a boyfriend or a sibling, can you turn that around to secure and or what is the point in those terms? No, I don't really think, honestly I don't think again for these there's a point of no return. I would say for parents, I don't know, probably approaching adolescence, right? They're, they're already sort of got that mindset, and by that time they're not as paid attention to you that you could probably be the person, at least at that moment, to 
kind of reinstitute that. You could do some work, I imagine, on it, getting into the trust shit, things like that. But um, yeah, I think certainly, and say you've got a two or three year old and they have this kind of avoidant um, or ambivalent style, um, I think it's about, if they're older, you can sort of negotiate some of these things a little bit. Um, they're, they're not gonna be feeling face, but you can tell a five year old Daddy's gonna be back in a week. I'm gonna miss you so much. I'll, I'll FaceTime you every day, right? You can, you know, you know, right? You can sort of talk through that if they're having that anxiety about you, about you leaving. Um, otherwise, it, it really is just gonna come in the form of the relationship. If you can't talk them through it, you're gonna have to demonstrate that consistency, right? And that doesn't mean not putting them in those situations that are causing that anxiety. Really, you want them to feel it and then to realize it's gonna resolve. I dropped you off at school every day for the first month. You were freaking out when I got there, when I got back, right? But after a while, you figured out, I'm gonna come at this time every day. You know, the teachers here are nice. They're gonna be, you know, cool with you, right? Then that's gonna kind of teach that, uh, that relationship. You, you can also, I'll say lastly, get these things to form, not by being away too much, but being there too much, right? If, if you never left your kid, the first time you take them to school, they're gonna lose their mind, right? If they've never been to somebody else's house, or you let the grandma keep them, or the babysitter so watches them, right? If they're just super unfamiliar to being separated to you, that first time is gonna be such a shock. They're gonna be like, what is happening to you? And you show back up, why the hell did you leave me here? Who's this one? And so it's about that balance, is the right answer. Yeah, yeah. One more. So what, is, what about um, children with a uh, father figure as their primary care provider? Sure. Is mother, is that affecting yeah, I'm saying mother um, in the way we say he <laughs> uh, here. It's usually the mother. But um, it doesn't matter. Again, it could be neighbor. It could be coach. It certainly can be that. Right? It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't have to be mother. It's just usually mother because she's the one. Well, I didn't mean because you're using it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just on your curious if you know. Yeah, this is anybody. This yeah. is anybody. Good question. All right, thank you for hanging out for a little bit longer. Um, this will be uploaded uh, today or tomorrow, and then um, we'll for uh, tomorrow's lecture, sometime after that, probably this weekend, uh, and we'll start talking about PJ's stages of development. That's the main thing that people will expect you to know out of the gen site development section. So uh, look for that. All right, I'll see you then. Have a good week. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, thank you.